Welcome everyone to our 280 Group Ask Me Anything session, and thank you for joining this morning. My name is Roger Snyder. I'm the VP of Marketing at 280 Group. Uh, we set our theme for this week's Ask Me Anything to be kind of what it's going to be like for product managers to deal with the new normal, but uh, we received a lot of questions ahead of time that were more about, well, what do I do right now? So I think we will try to kind of go back and forth dealing with both of those aspects of the question in terms of how should I be operating as a product manager under current circumstances? And you know, what can we do to get ready for the new normal? Before I go any further though, I'd like to introduce our panel. I'd really like to thank them all for joining us today. Uh, let me start with uh, Denise Hemke. Hi, Denise Hemke. Uh, thanks for having me here with you all today. Uh, I lead product management and strategy for analytics at Workday. Thank you very much, Denise. Anna Grace, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Anna Grace. Um, I am most recently the VP of product for Macy's, and I also serve on the board of women in product here in the Bay Area. Great, thank you for joining us today. Padma Shi, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Padma Shi Konedi. I am the chief product officer at a company called Eat Club based in Redwood City. I'm also the board member of PDX Women in Technology. Really happy to be here amidst all of my people. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us. David, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, good morning everybody. I'm David Nash, also coming to you from beautiful Portland, Oregon. I've been doing product for a long time. Uh, product manager, senior executive. I founded Product Camp Portland. Uh, I love helping people solve problems and I'm delighted to be with you guys this morning. Great. And Ken, last but not least, can you introduce yourself please? You're muted, Ken. Mute. Hi, I'm Ken. I'm glad glad to be in this esteemed panel over here. Um, I have been doing product product management for uh, 20 plus years, um, including every, everywhere from junior product manager to CPO at places like Amazon, Microsoft, and a whole host of startups up in the Seattle area. Um, I'm really happy to to to, in, to meet all of you, at least to meet you, um, and be part of this panel. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. So uh, folks, this isn't Ask Me Anything. We did get a number of questions that uh, were sent in ahead of time. So I wanna thank everybody who took the time to send in their questions ahead of time. We will kick things off by answering a few of those questions to get the ball rolling. So, uh, but I wanna encourage you all to make this a live conversation as well. So I would encourage you to type in any questions that you would like to have answered at today's panel in the chat box. So if you go into the chat box and type your question in there, uh, after we've answered a few of the questions that we received ahead of time, we'll then start kind of alternating between answering questions from the live panel, as well as answering questions that we received ahead of time. So we'll kind of roll back and forth between those. Uh, the process will be that most everyone should stay muted. Uh, when I see a question from, a from somebody who's attending, I will unmute you and ask you to say, state your name and where you're from. And then you can ask your question uh, audibly for all of us. And uh, then mute yourself again, please. And then we'll turn it over to the panel to do our best to try to answer your question. All right, so without further ado, let's start with some of these questions that we received ahead of time. Uh, the first question that I wanted to tackle uh, was actually something that David, you kind of brought up to begin with. Uh, you know, what do team meetings and dynamics look like when some or all, I would imagine many, all are remote or remote? And uh, Denise, I think you, several of you all had ideas here, but I would love to kick it off with Denise if you would like to answer that question to get started. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Definitely, I mean, my team prior to this was partially remote and predominantly though located in one place, um, but now everybody is remote. And so I think it's actually, you know, kind of a nice advantage to everybody being remote, which is the playing field is really level right now. Um, but I'm also grateful when you think back of how the technology's evolved in the past, you know, 10, 15 years, it's made it so much easier for us. But what I have found with everybody being remote is we've gotten a lot more creative about the tools that we're using. So we're using Jamboards, for instance, in lieu of whiteboards for brainstorming sessions. Um, we're using uh, Zoom uh, groups. So we're breaking out into groups to do brainstorming when we have larger meetings, but we still want to simulate kind of those smaller collaborative experiences. And then, you know, just like now with the virtual background that I have, 
Um, we've also been trying to make it fun, right? And bring in uh, virtual backgrounds and themes. And I know I see a lot of this happening. And even one of our recent PM all hands uh, for my team, we had a costume contest where people incorporated their virtual background to their costume. You know, so I dressed up even as Luigi, you know, had my Mario Brothers background uh, and my daughter even brought it, you know, came in for a moment to dress up as a princess. So I think there's also lots of ways that we can leverage this technology um, to bring some fun back to work, even in these, you know, challenging times where we're socially distanced. Uh, and so I think that that's really been helping people. And I think also it will also, um, you know, have us think in the future about how we might do things a little differently. Some of these um, new technologies or new or new techniques that we're developing, I think will stick. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, and David, do you want to share some of our practices that we've been using as well? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to, but first on Denise's point, I couldn't agree more. You know, there's been a, a real uh, dynamic over the years sometimes for teams that are home short or offshored or teams, you know, dealing with the headquarters versus remote office power dynamic where there's a power inequity and a power imbalance. And to Denise's point, I couldn't agree more. Everybody's home short now, right? So there's no us and them. <laughs> and it's been very, it's been very powerful. It's been, it's been liberating if you've ever had to deal with those dynamics in the past. And, you know, through Zoom, I, I'm living on Zoom now, like many of you, you know, 10 hours a day and you have to be all in. Because if you're not paying attention, you can get away with stuff when you're on the phone or, or, or in a different room that is, it's, it's not helpful to the meeting because people are paying continuous partial attention. I find the dynamic now is actually a lot more uh, productive. <clears throat> and I've gotten to know my colleagues like Roger and Kenny and others uh, that you know, we talk with very frequently. We do the Zoom thing because who's not now? And every day we have a theme. And I've gotten to know my colleagues even better then were we doing our normal, you know, daily standups before Zoom because I'm learning all kinds of things about them that are helping us uh, build a much more powerful team. So overwhelmingly, it's been very positive. Right. So for example, and, and, and building on that, yeah, building on that, David, I think, I think it's going to lead to um, better remote meetings long term from this. People are used to using remote technology. You know, I remember, you know, times of conference calls and hello, are you there? Are you not there? and people forgetting those folks on the squat box and all that kind of stuff. And I think one of the great things that'll happen as a result of this is that people are so comfortable with this type of arrangement that long-term, I think we're gonna have better remote meetings as a result thereof. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so to give a concrete example to our audience, this morning's theme for our office stand-up was, what was your favorite TV show when you were growing up? And so folks chose Zoom backgrounds that had images from their favorite TV shows. So that's a way, you know, back to the original question of like, how do you make these meetings not boring, not getting into a groove, but a little dynamic. And to Kenny's point, you learn more about the folks that uh, you are working with, especially folks that maybe you've been working with for a long time, but you don't see very often because they're thousands of miles away from you. So good, good question. So Roger, it was nice talking to you from the from the bridge of the Starship Enterprise this morning. That's right. David was on the bridge of the Enterprise this morning. That's right. All right. So our next question actually came all the way from Kenya. This is really cool. It came from Joy Kenyua. And I apologize, Joy, if I've mispronounced your name. Um, but the question was how to manage multiple products with remote teams. And what tools can be used to track that progress? And I like this last part of it too. How do you ensure momentum? with current set timelines. I'm gonna combine that question too with a question that we got from Richard Miller from British Columbia in Canada. Uh, he's all, he asked much the same question in terms of what collaboration tools do you recommend, right? So uh, Anna Grace, I think you had some thoughts on this one. You wanna share? Yeah, happy to share. So, um, so about a decade ago, uh, I was working as a product manager at Best Buy and um, I was allowed the opportunity to work remotely uh, from Texas and move out of Minneapolis. Um, and I, I got to do it for um, quite a long time um, and ended up being six years of remote, um, kind of in the early days of doing this. And um, I learned a lot about um, how to work remotely, what works and what, what doesn't work. Um, from a tools perspective, um, I think the tools have only gotten, you know, just better and better over the last decade for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of the things that we need are available to us today, whether it be Slack 
or um, Jira or uh, Teams, Zoom. I mean, there's so many different platforms that you can use. Um, but obviously, agreeing on on the ones that you as a team are going to use are critically important. Um, and figuring out like how does that work best across all the different um, platforms and such that you need to communicate. Um, I would also suggest um, you know using these tools obviously more often, um, but to, like everyone else has said, like including more humanity in that um, and bringing that forward as much as possible, whether it's through the use of the background or um, you know more patience as it as you know maybe children run in the room and things like that happen that are very natural and normal given the times that we're in. Um, but so I think from a motivating standpoint, you know, you really don't have to change a lot from the standpoint of the tooling, but just bringing that like in a more holistic view for the team to come together and say, here are the protocols that we use together, the, that we agree upon. Here are the rules, you know, whether they're norms or rules of our organization that we're going to go by, like um, we're going to use backgrounds, we're not going to use backgrounds, we're, you know, and then also keeping in mind that Old fashioned tools are great too. Not every meeting has to be a Zoom meeting. Um, and sometimes it's okay to just pick up the phone. There is Zoom fatigue and um, <laughs> and it's okay to not always have to be camera ready uh, at every moment. So giving a lot of patience, I think is one of the most motivating things um, is being patient with one another. That's a really good point, yeah. And Denise, you had talked a little bit about accountability and how to, how to keep people, uh, you know, keep momentum with current timelines. Can maybe you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think um, that piece definitely resonated with me around momentum, um, because I think this is an especially multi project or multiple products and especially as you get into larger size companies. Oftentimes your success um, on a product or a project is not just contained within your team right you need other teams and the downstream dependencies um, to be fulfilled in order for you to be successful. And so at Workday, um, for example, we use uh, key results, objectives and key results. Um, so if you haven't read Measure What Matters, great book to read on how to adopt kind of these principles. But that's something that we have been using for um, over a year now, I think, to really help drive alignment and transparency, right? And I think the transparency is really key. Hey, what matters to me? And what am I trying to move the needle on? And are we in lockstep? Are we in this together so that we know we're going to get to a successful outcome? And right. I think that can also help with the momentum piece, right? Which is, you know, how do we also make sure that we're chunking this up into quarterly milestones? So if your goal is to get to, hey, I want 100 customers live by the end of the year, then let's make sure that we're breaking that up into quarterly. We need to get 25 live, then 50 live, and so on and so on, so that we know, you know, when we're going off course. Um, and how we can then start to course correct. So that's right. been a really useful tool for us to really um, help with that momentum and help with the alignment. Uh, so I would you know, encourage that. There's lots of tools out there that can aid in this. We use Workboard. I'm not I'm saying you have to use Workboard, but um, that's been something that's been really useful for us to get those updates um, and, and find ways that leadership can then hook in and support the team uh, towards their goals. Right. Yeah, a lot of these online collaboration tools have been very helpful during this time, right? So Absolutely. another example is like we're using Asana, right? And and as April closed, I got my team together and we looked over our quarterly goals and said, okay, how are we doing on making progress towards all those quarterly goals and what barriers are in the way right now? And then we were able to revise some of those goals as well as add more tasks that needed to be done in order to keep the momentum going for the rest of the quarter. And David, you had mentioned a couple more tools for collaboration online, right? Yeah, there's no shortage of tools. I mean, you know, we don't endorse third party tools specifically, but we're all using the same tools. You've heard some of them go by so far. So whether you're an Office 365 person or a Google Drive person and, or open office person, they're the same tools we've always used. I guess the distinction I would make now is that there's a subtle but important distinction between on time, you know, online real time collaboration where we're all looking at the same thing and kind of the drive by collaboration where Roger and I, for example, are reviewing a blog post and, you know, we'll have something in a central place. He'll leave his comments. I might not see those comments for hours later. And then, and then we'll feed back. So kind of leaving an audit trail, change management, you know, the stuff that developers figured out long times ago for not breaking source code check-ins, you know, you have to be a little more rigorous about that stuff today because we're in different time zones and you want to work together effectively, even when you're not on the phone together at the same time. But uh, that, that's become more critical, I think, at this, point, at this time. 
Definitely. So <clears throat> there are tools like, you know, creative canvases as well for brainstorms. One of the other questions that, that we may get to is the fact, how do I get some collaboration going, right? And so canvas tools like Mural or Miro, yeah. uh, those kind of tools will allow you, and, and Trello will allow you to also do more interaction, live interaction as well. So there's lots of tools. Like you said, we don't endorse any particular tool, but we've, we've heard from our clients and we use some of them ourselves. So just want to throw some names out there if you are struggling to, to look for some tools to use. I would, I would also just, uh, ed, you know, recommend that you're flexible. So if you're an Office 365 person and you're dealing with Google, Google Docs for the first time or Google Sheets, uh, they're kind of similar, but just enough to make you maybe a little hesitant or going the other way from Google or something else to Microsoft. Just you'll, you'll learn the 20% that you need to do, you know, 80% of what you get. So look at it a time to embrace new stuff and, and gain some new skills. Yeah. And I think, you know, get, given the environment where everybody's disconnected, I think the usage of collaboration tools starts to go up, right? Is these are always available, and especially real-time collaboration tools. These are always available, always there, but people sat in their offices or at their desks and you tended to do, as you, David said, you had this sort of remote collaboration going on, even though you're in the same office, same location. And now, interestingly enough, given that we're all remote, some of these real-time collaboration opportunities are taking taking force because we've broken down, you know, invisible walls of the office um, seemingly to happen where people know they're sitting on a Zoom, they see that, you know, you're, you're sitting together and you actually collaborate together in real time. It's, it's, it's been fascinating from that standpoint. Yeah, it's definitely been a lifesaver for allowing collaboration and then the tracking tools allow everyone to see in real time what's going on. So we'll move on to the next question. I also want to pause and just encourage all of you who are here to, if you've got questions, please type them into the group chat and uh, we will be able to start taking your questions shortly. Uh, the next question that we have was from, and again, I'm probably going to uh, mispronounce his name, so I apologize up front, but Safai Tandogan from Istanbul asked, what should we focus on most during these lockdowns as product managers? And Padmashi, I think you had some thoughts you wanted to share on this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know where all of your backgrounds are from and what sorts of jobs and companies and products you're all working on. So with that caveat, I'll propose something that I think y'all should be thinking about. You know how there's that quadrant of urgent versus important? You know, mm -hmm. certain things are not urgent, not important. Certain things are urgent, but not important. Um, to me, at this point in time, it is quite possible that you're not serving customers, or maybe you're seeing a reduced demand for your, for your software or your products that you've built. If the time is less busy and less reactive, then one of the things I would suggest is it's the perfect time for you to step back and sort of look at the big picture. Are there, asp I mean, product management is such a broad and vast field, right? We all know that we're expected to do the, all the way up on the left side with visioning and strategy, all the way up on the right with execution. So. When there's such a big sprawl, it's possible that as product managers, you might be having certain gaps. And maybe this makes you uncomfortable, but there may be certain areas of the product management responsibilities that you might not have focused enough on. As an example, maybe you've always been meaning to sit down with your finance partner and understand the PL of your business. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are specific processes that are broken in the way you're shipping software that you know you need to make better, but you haven't had the time because you've always been serving customers and such. Um, is it possible that there's some really good re-architecture that can happen in the system and the architecture of your software that you could sit down with your engineering team and figure out so that when you are back into full service, you have a much more scalable system, perhaps technical debt, things like that. If there are those important but not urgent things in your business that you have not been focusing as product managers, I would highly encourage you to go pick those areas and go dig deeper into them because you have the time now to do it. And guess what? When you come back, it will actually make your business better and it will make you a better product manager. Great point. Absolutely. And Denise, you were rather emphatic in what you thought people needed to be focused on right now. Want to share a little bit? You mean roadmap, roadmap, roadmap? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, inertia, you know, just the law of inertia continues to carry us forward on a trajectory that we're, that we're on, right? And I think that it's a good time to step back and evaluate your roadmap, um, kind of to Padmashi's um, point, like it is a great time to evaluate, hey, what am I doing? What else could I be doing differently? But to make sure that your roadmap is going to support your customers, you know, in the new normal that we are facing. 
because while well, this period of time feels probably like eternity to lots of people, you know, in the grand scheme of our lives, it will be a moment, but it will be a moment that, you know, has forevermore changed us and it will be, um, and the outcome will be different. It will look different. And so the question is, does your do your current plans really help support your customers in the best way possible and so i think it is a great time to really reevaluate that and and course correct if you need to right it's, it's a chance to pivot i think the other thing is to me that you know manager is in our title of product managers right mm -hmm. and so i think that that puts a lot of responsibility on PMs in, in ways that maybe it doesn't put on all types of roles, right? I know lots of engineers who are thriving right now because this is like the ultimate maker time. They're like, give me my JIRA and I'm good <laughs> to go, right? Um, but I think for us, oftentimes it's gotten harder because walking what would have been a five minute conversation at somebody's desk has turned into, and maybe you had five of those, has now turned into an hour and a half of Zoom meetings to make sure you're aligned. You know, so I think communication at this time is really, really key. And you know, it's back to that urgency importance matrix, making sure that we're working on what's the most important, making sure that we're working on what's urgent and trying to, you know, squash the things that might get in the way of our success. Um, because the reality of it is, and, and we all, I think, are coming to terms with this, is that, you know, well, well, I think we've been able to adapt really well, we need to be honest that not everybody is able to operate at the same productivity level that they once were. Many people, and I've got, you know, I'm a parent, I have a three-year-old, I know lots of parents on my team, that now this is their second job, right? They're a caregiver, they are a teacher, an educator, and they are doing what was their day job. And I love and I'm proud to be at a company that has really supported employees and puts employees first. Um, but it, it means that we need to be ruthless, even more ruthless than we were before, but really ruthless about how we spend our time. Um, and maybe the last point I would make on this is just about engagement. There are people who aren't thriving, right? There are people that are struggling. Maybe they live alone and so they don't have um, a three-year-old to entertain them um, in the evenings. And so, um, and whatever their circumstance may be. And so I think also, you know, again, as you know, kind of leaders and every product manager in my mind is a leader, as leaders of these teams, also engaging with the team to make sure and check in, hey, how are you doing? You know, using some of those tools that we talked about earlier to make meetings fun, to get people involved, you know, to, to bring them into the conversation um, because not everybody is thriving and it's something that, you know, we all, we're all in this together and and i know that we all want to support each other and so i think we're well positioned in our roles um, to kind of be the glue that helps teams do that right so be ruthless with yourself in yeah. terms of how you manage your time <laughs> but, but be generous compassionate, with us. <laughs> compassionate with your co-workers who may be struggling to to be productive in these circumstances right absolutely endless grace you know um endless grace and and yeah be generous with others but ruthless with your own time and encourage them to be ruthless with their time right to say hey don't do those things that are low priority focus right. on what matters right so this is a critical question if anybody else on the panel wants to chime in on this one feel free in terms of how do we make sure we're focusing on the right things during this time okay you know i think nothing to add that was really good what denise did Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is an interesting time to see where our products um, and services scale and don't scale, right? So we're finding out right now, uh, store retail doesn't work uh, at the moment, <laughs> but online, you know, is now the focus, right? And um, at Macy's, before I was leaving, one of the things that we were trying to figure out is how do we quickly move into like a curbside delivery scenario, something that had been discussed for years and, you know, banding around, around like, oh, can we do it? Do we have the bandwidth? You know, um, suddenly, you know, we, we kind of jumped on it and came together as a leadership team and said, all right, it, I felt like the Apollo 13 mission. It was like, what do we have available? How can we <laughs> glue this together to make a good customer experience? Um, so I think one of the, uh, the things that this crisis is bringing up is showing us where our, our products, our capabilities um, excel and where maybe they don't and give us an opportunity to dig into those areas where perhaps we should be maybe putting some more focus so that we're a little bit more resilient as organizations. Right, absolutely, yeah. We're seeing many examples, right, where 
things that you had sort of on your back burner for years are suddenly brought to the fore. And our, in our own company, we've been doing this as well in terms of accelerating, you know, we always wanted to do more online offerings. Well, now is the time for us to be getting those online offerings out there, right? And curbside delivery, right? And here in California, uh, the ABC relaxed their rules. You can now get a curbside margarita. And I'm like, okay, that's a rule I want to keep when this is all over with. But, uh, you know, that kind of stuff is, is, is opens up opportunities for innovation. So look at the changing landscape right now in terms of regulatory and, and rules and see whether or not there are new opportunities for you to take advantage of these things, right? Roger, that's the most important thing I've learned today so far. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry, you're not in California. David. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to go to a, a question from our audience. Um, Rafael Lopes, I'm going to unmute you and I'd invite you to share your name and also um, tell us where you're from and share your question uh, with us. And I pressed the unmute button, but it seems like I'm getting a little bit. There we go. Rafael? Hello everyone, uh, Raphael here. Um, I would like to hear from the panelists. Um, in terms of uh, when you restart recruiting or if you're recruiting now, what are, what are the soft skills that you feel are the most important um, to bring into your teams today? Great, and where are you from, Raphael? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, all right, great. Thank you for sharing your question. Panelists? Well, I've, uh, I guess I'll start, if that's all right. Please. Uh, soft skills have always been important in product, right? We, we have things that have been around forever, like being really good listeners, being really good probers, uh, being empathetic, asking why. And especially now when you have several degrees of interaction, either removed or modified, you know, it, it's vital to do good discovery because product managers are going to change disciplines. They're going to change careers. They're going to change verticals. And so if you are doing retail, for example, and, and you're moving into some other field entirely, uh, the soft skills and, and the product leadership skills are the ones that are portable and they help you learn, you know, learning new domain very quickly. So in summary, uh, good listening, good discovery, not just tolerance of ambiguity, but being able to thrive in an ambiguous environment and really understand, quickly understand what's important to know first and, and leveraging the experts and resources around you. And I think Denise really sort of nailed it on the head when she was uh, on the last question. She talked about engagement, right? And the ability to engage folks. It's become critically more important when you can't do that five minute, you know, five, minute, five second or five minute uh, walk behind is how do you engage people and get them to interact and make sure you understand the situation they are in and build and plan for whatever situation they might be involved with. So sort of that empathy and engagement model is crucial to product managers to move products forward and move and, and move, um, the, the ball forward, if you will, just that little bit, understanding each person's nuances and how they might fit into the overall perspective of people. Yeah, I think a great interview question is, what did you do during the time of COVID? Like, what did you do? Whether you were working, whether you weren't working, how did you use this time? And I actually read this in a, maybe a Medium article. The opposite is also true. As a candidate, important to ask the organizations that you're going into, what did you do as an organization during the time of COVID to help your community, to help your customers and your employees? Oh, yeah. Great point. Absolutely. Plus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would also throw in that this is a good time to be uh, thinking about your diplomacy and negotiation skills as well. So now that uh, you, you are constrained in that you can't read the body languages effectively, I mean, Zoom helps, right? But you still can't fully read the body language of folks. You do need to amp up the listening skills as David was talking about, but also be thinking about how are you going to influence a, a group or an executive to be able to make progress on an initiative that otherwise might be stalled right now. So uh, there's several different books on this. The Psychology of Influence is one of them. There's many others out there. Uh, take a look at those to help amp up your abilities to influence and negotiate because it's even harder to do under the circumstances we find ourselves in right now. And yet as a product manager, it's a powerful skill. And, and to Anna's point, if that's a skill you can build up now, just imagine how more effective you're going to be as a product manager when we are able to start getting back together again in an office space, or for your continued relationships with folks that are, have always been and will continue to be remote whenever we sort of get back to what we call a, a new normal. So I hope that helps, Raphael, in answering a couple of your questions. 
Uh, I want to move on to the next question that we had from our uh, pre-submitted questions. And this one was a long one. I'm going to try to condense it a little bit. Uh, this question came from Virginia Robbins in California. Uh, in, in her particular case, she's in a business, she's in a B2B business uh, that offers technologies to uh, banking customers. And the banking customers are, of course, very much constrained by regulations. So uh, she points out, we spent a lot of time reviewing and incorporating economic variables into our models. And right now the economic situation is completely unclear. You know, what if a forecast of a near future that's uh, recessionary is not quite right, given all these, these government uh, investments? So how do we plan for these contingencies with so much uncertainty and limited budgets with lowered revenue as well, right? I think this is a question that's on many people's minds. So uh, we, we did some softball questions earlier. This is a harder one, <laughs> panelists. Let's help this looks out. Uh, what's that? Kenny, you wanna help us out? Oh, okay, yeah, happy to, happy to tackle some of the more difficult ones. Um, it's interesting, this one, one of the things to realize is that probably from an economic perspective, we're in probably the highest um, state of uncertainty that we've been in in, in, in years and years. I mean, mm -hmm. I just surpasses what happened in 2008 from an uncertainty perspective. We don't know what's gonna be happening next week, next month, clearly not next year or three years from now. So incorporating those kinds of things into our plans becomes more and more difficult, as you mentioned. But in some ways, they're, 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 forces of that that are liberating. Um, and what happened is, is I think there's the opportunity for all of us, regardless of the size of the organization we're in, to adopt uh, some of those lean startup mentalities and those kind of things. In some senses, that level of uncertainty has put us all in the state of really being a startup. We don't know what's gonna happen next week. We don't know what's gonna happen next month. So getting into that mode of experimentation, incrementalization, going out and adapting, failing fast and adjusting as a result thereof, now becomes an imperative for all of us. And as a result, what happens is actually, I think your customers are more willing to live in that state too, where they're taking smaller steps. They're taking more incremental steps to move forward as, as they go along, right? And building that into your models and, and being willing to live in that state of uncertainty, right? Where you're adjusting fast, right? Where you're, where you're testing all the time um, as you're going out there, because you don't know what tomorrow's what tomorrow is going to bring. Unlike you know some stay in industries where you you sort of knew what life was going to look like a year from now, you could build a roadmap for three years and and be at least sixty percent certain that that was how you're going to execute. That's not the case anymore, right? Um, and so I think we all should adopt and embrace some of those lean startup mentality and thought processes that the startups have done all along, and really have the ability now. For all of us to act in, in that manner, right? I, I think it's a great opportunity from that standpoint. And again, scenario analysis: what's it look like, right? What could happen if you know build the scenarios based on what's going to happen? The variability in those analyses is going to go broader and further as a result thereof, and be willing to live in that state. And I think um, it'll. It, I think from a corporate America standpoint, um, I think there's a huge opportunity that comes with the uncertainty that we're going to face in the next six, nine, 12, 18 months, if you will. Right, right. Yeah, and if I could add to that, um, all yes to all the things Kenny said, and I think over here, Richard Miller also says, agile principles, 100%, um, absolutely right. Be scrappy about the models you're building. The one piece I'd add on top of all of that is really engage your leadership. If you're lucky enough to have a leadership that's fairly transparent with you and is able to engage you in you know, different ways that they're thinking and seeing the market, then engage them so that you become their partner, you start serving them better, you start giving them those models and scenarios to sit down and talk about, but be connected with them. That way you're, you're in service of the larger purpose and where they wanna take the company. Um, and then, and then if, you know, I, like I said, I truly, there are many leadership teams out there who are not that transparent, but you know, if you're in this situation of uncertainty together, knowing that you're there for them will be a really valuable, you'll, you'll be a really valuable asset to them. That's a very good point, yeah. And David, you had some thoughts to share, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna pile on with Kenny also. The, you know, there's, there's, I think, a popular misconception that lean startup is, is all startups, right? The build, test, learn loop. But many of us don't work for startups. Many of us work in established markets which are being disrupted now more than ever. And I would say, you know, what lean startup uh, 
uh, posits for MVP or minimum viable product, we're all working on what we call MBI, the minimum business increment for the next thing we're doing. So the build test learn loop is, is vital for an established company in product with mature uh, customers and product lines and IT organizations as it is for, for startups. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is we have always had to embrace uncertainty and ambiguity in product management because you're never gonna have the amount of data that you need to make a fully confident decision, period. So get over that. Uh, and the idea is when you're doing forecasting now, this, uh, what I'm going to say may seem blasphemous, but I found it to be true in my career. It's actually much more important that you get your executive team and your stakeholders aligned on what your decision criteria is. And so when you're developing a forecast, for example, don't overthink it. You know, do positive, do, pardon me, pessimistic, optimistic, realistic. Yes. Understand the hinge factors for each because you're going to be wrong. Your forecast is going to be wrong. But the idea is you will have brought your team along with you. They will understand what the hinge factors are. Likewise for the risk analysis, who could have predicted this black swan event we're living through now? So you're not gonna be able to predict all the things that can kill you. Identify the top three, identify your plans to either preempt them if you can or mitigate them if you can't preempt them. And when that bad thing happens, you will have thought through and the team won't unwind and panic because you will have gained confidence in bringing everybody together on the decisions so they don't get unmade. Yeah, you know, I would add to that because I think, you know, you never know when the next crisis slash opportunity is around the corner. Um, one of the things that I remember from my Best Buy days is that um, I was there when we were still competing against Circuit City. And I remember that when Circuit City uh, went bankrupt, there was a, you know, a bit of an excitement in the organization. Like, we beat our nemesis. This was, you know, um, the biggest thing that everyone, you know, was sort of waiting to do to be number one consumer electronics retailer in the country. Um, but what what some people didn't notice that quietly in the background, Amazon and Walmart were, were coming up. And so we, sure, we took down Circuit City, but now we were facing the world's largest uh, physical retailer and digital retailer. And I think that um, what we learned out of that was the, the importance of wargaming, right? And just like on a regular basis, every six months, like what happens if, and literally take a day away, a retreat and go, okay, we just lost our biggest competitor. Like what's now, what's happening? Or, you know, a brand new competitor has come into the space that dominate, you know, like how would you respond? And having some of these things just thought through, even though they may never happen, um, actually makes, you know, your business that much more resilient, you know, whatever may come. Mm -hmm. I want to point out, uh, I think we've all made some great points, especially about scenario planning. I want to point out an article that I read last week from McKinsey uh, that had an actual structured approach to levels and, de and degrees of uncertainty. And it allowed you not only to David's point to have several different scenarios, you know, optimistic versus pessimistic, but it also gave you a structured framework to think through, well, what are the variables out in this marketplace that aren't going to vary very much? And I can probably at least have an envelope plan for, and what are the variables that are going to be wildly variable? And maybe I need to have so much more flexibility there. And that just helps you structure your thinking. Uh, in the email that we send out as a follow-up to this AMA, uh, I'll include a link to that article and that'll help you structure your approach to trying to get a handle on well, how uncertain is some of this uncertainty versus other aspects of this uncertainty. So great feedback, folks. Great question as well. Um, all right, let's see here. Unless anybody has anything else they want to move uh, to add, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, okay, so uh, next question that was submitted ahead of time was from Dominique uh, Poupar, and I, again, apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, from Quebec. Um, with travel limitations, how do we replace meaningful exchange with sales folks and customers and trade shows or on sales floors of various dealers around the world? How do we evaluate the economic recession separately? How do we evaluate the economic recession impact on future sales of products? So let's take the first part first, right? In terms of the travel limitations, how do we still have some meaningful exchange with sales folks and customers? And uh, Padmashree, I think you kind of had a, a lead in on yeah. this Yeah, lots, <laughs> lots of points have already been brought up so far and I'll continue to maintain the caveat. Again, each of you might be in very different sectors and segments in terms of what sorts of products and services you develop. Um, depends on what you're seeking out with these people, right? If you're seeking customer feedback on your products and services, I don't see travel limitations per se as limitations for not getting that customer feedback. 
um, let's say you want to set up a beta program, maybe you have to send them something physically over mail for them to try out. I don't know if it happens to be a hardware product, but mm -hmm. you shouldn't really feel like a beta program is somehow limited because you can't physically travel. Like I think was described before, so many companies, including my own, who thought that remote work was not possible, are all going to that step change and they're realizing that it's actually possible to get a lot of work done. Sure, with some limitations, but it's possible to get things done. So I'd say that, that as far as getting feedback. Now, let's say you want to engage customers um, so that you can understand their needs better. Uh, one, one thing that we've realized, I happen to be in the food business and we're not doing any service right now, is the customers we serve are all worried about what's happening in the space of COVID-19 and how they should be thinking about their office comeback plans. So guess what? We're putting together an advisory board. Ideally, I would love to get a lot of information back from those customers as it relates to my product, but make it less about you for a second. So if you were to pull people together into an advisory board, can you bring maybe a thought leader or an expert from the community? Give something back to them. Um, I'm a strong believer that if you think if you're able to deliver value to your customers, that value will come back to you in spades in the form of loyalty, in the form of new product um, offering ideas, things like that. Um, and then as it relates to, do you want me to take the second part or just wait on, wait on the second part Let's on the, the first part first? Yeah. 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 So those are some things I would, I would suggest. I think it's really reaching out and making sure that you have a way to deliver some value to them, understanding their needs, where they are at right now, how much they've been hit by the business, uh, by the, how much their business has been impacted by COVID-19 and, and such, and then trying to see what value you can deliver to them. It's still possible to do it remotely. Right. Others? I think to Pat Mishri's point, it, it's no harder now than it was before to, to, to get people to pay attention if you have a value proposition, if you have something that's intriguing. I mean, this week I reached out to a potential partner uh, and I had something that, you know, is enough of value to them where we got them to respond fairly quickly and we're going to explore where that goes. So I think just because of this pandemic, uh, I think people have an unprecedented willingness and consideration for trying new things now because everything is up for grabs. And I, I think you can have openings now that weren't open to you months ago because people were just heads down, you know, in their hole every day doing their thing and, and people are are looking for signals and looking for new things now. And that creates, I think, much more opportunity than, than it destroys. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we've definitely been engaging with clients as well and prospects to get feedback and have found that, you know, we send a survey out with SurveyMonkey and that we're getting good response rates, right? Um, the, more, the more direct touch, you know, with the travel limitations aspect of this, I think your question was also a little bit about how do I encourage that direct touch? You know, encourage your sales folks to start using Zoom, start using phone calls, whatever that works well, to pick up that phone, pick up that Zoom and, and have one-on-one -on -one conversations as well. Encourage, especially in B2B, encourage those one-on-one -on -one conversations to continue or to even to expand. Because now a salesperson who is worth their salt should be able to reach out to 10 customers in a day and be able to get a lot more contact in one day than if they were flying to Kansas City or flying down to Texas just to talk to one person in one day, right? So I think uh, we've got to ask them to be a little more innovative in their approaches as well. And if you model that by your usage of these various tools we've been talking about, hopefully, and then encourage them, hey, turn around and use those tools. Go have those conversations with channel partners, with customers, gather that feedback, send it back to me as the product manager so I can collect it and be able to start seeing the trends, seeing the, the real problems that our customers are having that we can help solve, right? I think that that would really help a lot. Yeah, yeah and, just and Roger, one last I think, thing. I, can I, can, Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Oh, no, I think one of the things to realize is that reduction in business travel is not a short-term impact, it's a long-term impact that will result from what we're seeing here. Corporations are gonna realize that they don't need to do as much business travel as they have in the past. So some of the skills and techniques that you're learning today on leveraging Zoom and using Zoom to interact with customers and interact with partners and interact with salespeople, I think becomes a skill you can leverage long-term. And to your point, Roger, it will, it will create new opportunities to leverage yourself, right? Because now it's not a one-day trip to Kansas City and then another day trip to Dallas and then another day trip to Oklahoma City, right? You can cover all those in one day, right? So now you can have three of those discussions without having to get on an airplane and, and, and work your way through the airport and find the rental car and all that kind of stuff. So I think in some ways that's freeing, 
um, and the fact that on the other side, people are more interactive on tools like Zoom and, and seeing face-to-face -face kind of thing. So I think you're, you're gonna replace some of those um, you know, uh, convention center discussions that you may have had at a conference before with some of these other tools. And in some ways, have the opportunity to do more remotely than you actually could do face to face. Right. Yeah, and the one last point I wanted to make on that is it's possible that your vendors, customers are not thinking of you right now. So don't get discouraged if they don't get back to you. Um, if you do actually believe that your product direction has value for them in this new and changing world, then stay persistent and keep pushing. Find different ways, different segues, different openings uh, in order to find a way to reach them. But yeah, there's a good chunk of customers who are not thinking about my product or service right now. That's the thing on their minds and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. you know, also just be prepared for, for a little bit of, uh, of that as you persist. Yeah, be persistent. So to, okay. Double down a little bit on um, really quickly on the creativity. You know, I'm taking some inspiration from the wine industry. Um, maybe some of you have seen that th there's now new virtual tastings happening mm -hmm. online where you can sort of go to the tasting room, that you order a batch of wines, and you sit with the winemaker and you taste them together. I mean, how fun is that, right? A completely new thing that was invented because of this crisis. Um, so if you're trying to, you know, get it with an, an executive of some sort, maybe you um, struggle to you know, have time with it might be fun to put together a little virtual care package that you send to them and like hey i would have brought donuts but like i'm sending you this and you know I, I create an experience around that right? right um because i think we're all looking for that we're on the four same four walls you know anything that's delightful um that is different um is going to make me go huh okay you know i'll talk to that vendor um i wouldn't have had time to do that in any other time, because I'm, as many of us, busy back to back. Um, I generally don't take vendor calls, but if I get something very unique and interesting, um, you know, to break the monotony sometimes of the day, like, like, oh, wow, I'll, I'll take time with this, right? And I will also share that just personally, I have found that um, I have been using this time to get um, boned up on several tools that um, I'd always wanted to take a look at and never had time. I've saved myself two hours of commuting a day, um, plus, you know, all these breaks and chats that you have. So I find that I actually do have more time to, you know, return vendor calls and get a little bit more information, but make it delightful and easy. And um, I always like to say people love, love to buy, but they don't like to feel sold. So just, you know, can, can make, they can fun make it an experience and make it a partnership right yeah very good very good input i like that on it um so we got another okay there was a second part of the question right so how to evaluate the economic recession impact on future sales of products i think we talked a little bit about scenario planning already uh, but does anybody else have any other thoughts they wanted to share on this question for me um I have started to do a few things uh, for my own business and I suggest this with other folks as well. I, I would step back and again, look at the entire supply chain of your product or service, do some industry research. Who's upstream to you? Who's downstream to you? How are they suffering through the supply chain? Do some of that research. And then a huge go-to at this point in time is also competitive research. Right. What are your competitors doing? Have they pivoted into a different direction? Are they offering something completely new and different? Have they gone bankrupt? Have they been doing layoffs? Um, are there different ways that they're marketing their product or service on, the, on their websites or other mechanisms today? And I think the third part also is to the extent that you're able to connect with your customers, do that as well. What new problems are they facing? And that is probably going to give you new ideas for features that you might have not normally prioritized in the past, but that you now think will be actually delightful to them for where they are. Uh, that's definitely been true for us as well. And, and you know, using those three dimensions to, again, continue to push your awareness and understanding of the, of the market, the industry, and what that impact, or how that, that impacts your own products uh, will be a really valuable thing to assess and then do some of the modeling that we've all been hearing about. Plus one on the competitive analysis, raise your hand if you feel like you do enough competitive analysis. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is a golden opportunity. I've been up to my eyeballs in competitive analysis for weeks, and mm -hmm. uh, very very helpful. Absolutely. Good. Good. All right. So I'd like to get the next question from the audience. Um, I'm going to press the unmute button since it seems to take a while. Uh, Danny Clark, you want to share your question as an agile coach? Hi. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for. Uh 
taking my uh, question today. So um, I'm an Agile coach for Tesco in the UK. Um, and we're very much, uh, when we're in the office, uh, continually um, asked questions, asked to go in and help coach teams. Um, and that's very much um, come to a stop now that we're working remotely. Um, so we've sent out lots of communications just to sort of say, you know, hi, we're still here, we can still help coach, um, even though um, it might be slightly different. But because there's such a um, focus on delivering right now because we are retail um, sort of serving Britain shoppers and um, so it's kind of a case of my question I guess is how could we engage more with teams um, to look at their ways of working um, and help teams moving forward as an agile coach great question thank you Danny panel I have a clarifying question for Danny if you would are, are these the actual development teams, you know, scrum teams, or are they kind of agile operational teams that are doing things other than dev or both or all? All. <laughs> so we work with a wide range of um, uh, different teams. Um, so we walk, uh, work uh, alongside technology teams around dev, engineering, um, so sort of front end and back end. Um, and we also work with uh, other teams right across the business. As we know, Agile has evolved from the software days and it can be sort of used right across the business. So sort of right across, um, you know, it could be finance, um, could be technology, um, anywhere Good. across the business. And do you have an existing network, be it Slack or the hundred other things inside, you know, to, to reach these folks just electronically? Uh, yeah, we do have um, several, several tools that we can, that we've been using and, and trying to communicate to um, and just sort of say, hey, we're still here. Um, don't forget about us. Um, but because there's just a, such that focus on delivery, it's, it's difficult to get that engagement. Sure, sure. One thing that might work even better than saying we're here to help is that people don't often ask for help in the moment because they're they're trying to put out a fire. You may want to, uh, since you have channels to these folks, which is a tremendous advantage, is to say, hey, here's what I learned yesterday, which sounds a lot like the thing that you're working on. Now, you won't have the context and immersion that they will have because they're working on it, and you're maybe removed from the immediacy of it. But I learned something that I think applies to you. Here's what this other team is doing, some great thing you read, which they may not need in that moment, but that way you're delivering value and you're intriguing them and you're provoking them to really engage back to you. You can gamify it also if you have some funny money and it doesn't have to be expensive. You can gamify interaction internally by just giving props. I know uh, I'm still very active in Slack channels at companies I no longer work for because the development community is very tight. And you know, people, are, people wanna know there's people like them who empathize, who know what they're doing. And you of course do this in your coaching practice. Uh, but offer them something that, that they can use, something they may not have known, uh, and that's going to deliver value uh, stronger than saying, how can I help? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe to add on to what David um, mentioned is I also think, you know, to that point of, the, hey, they may not ask for help right now because they're so busy with X, Y, and Z, and they're focused with execution knowing where they're struggling, you have an incredible set of skills. And I actually think what we're seeing a lot is that skills are the new economy, right? And it's kind of the same thing that Anna said before, or Anna said before, you know, pivoting from, you know, brick and mortar to digital. And so companies are looking to it. How do I take somebody with a particular set of skills and how do I help pivot those set of skills to help a team in need, right? To help the business in need and where the, where the business needs are. And so I think also maybe one way to also think about it is, you know, can you use your, your coaching skills to more actively help them with that execution, right? Because now knowing that is more pivotal to the business now than ever, and knowing that you have this incredible set of skills, you know, getting in there and saying, hey, what, what is challenging you right now okay, we're really struggling getting, you know, X, Y, Z product to market. And that is really crucial to our customers, you know, given the crisis that we're in, you know, maybe doing more than coaching, right. And, and going a step above that coaching side and really helping coach, but coach through execution because your skill set aligns to it so much. And, and I think that will be seen as such a huge win for the organization. Um, but it's really capitalizing again on that skill set that you've developed. Yeah. And I would, I would encourage you for across the different segments of your business, have a brainstorm meeting with your team and think of, 
okay, what, what, are, what are the problems they have right now? And if you do have the ability to go out and validate that with a quick survey, if not, then even just throw out some ideas of, for each of the different segments of, the, of Tesco, what are some of the problems they're facing right now? How could I deliver to them some uh, help? An article link, a suggested best practice, maybe a, a, a session on a specific part of that business that you know they would like, and then you're able to offer them uh, a direct suggestion that might be able to help them more specifically. And then that'll get the wheel turning in terms of like, oh, wow, this agile coaching thing is really helping me. I want more, right? And that would get the wheel turning for you. Anyone else? Um, we're getting close to the end here, folks. So I, I wanna be respectful of folks' time. We certainly have more questions to answer, but it's also almost, uh, the end of our hour. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today. And I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. Uh, Denise, thank you so much for joining us. And Padmashi and Anna Grace, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will send a follow-up email with uh, links to a couple of the topics that we talked about today. I also encourage you to uh, head over to 280group.com and check out our resources tab. We've got blogs and recordings. We will put the recording of this session up too. So if you want to share the recording with others uh, and keep sending us questions, we're going to keep uh, having Ask Me Anything sessions and webinars, and we want to be here for you to help you through this crisis as product managers. Any last words, panelists? Anything, uh, parting ideas to give to the, to the team? As we said at the top, uh, this is our tribe. It's great to be with you all, and thanks for showing up. Anna Grace, anything you want to say? No, same. Just so grateful to have, you know, tribe, this family um, to rely on, and we need each other now more than ever. So be kind to one another. Mm -hmm. Yes. I liked what Denise said. Ruthless with ourselves, compassionate with everyone else. But then you had a better phrase. What was that, Denise? Uh, yeah, I would just say generous, you know, be generous, endless grace. I think this is a time where, you know, we just, you know, we're all, we're all trying to be resilient fighting through this. And so we are all in it together. So thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to hearing more questions from you and hopefully you'll find our resources online. Hopefully. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Great to be here. All the best. Bye-bye.